Welcome to Acre Interview, I'm Mike King, your host, and this is part two of our interview with Mark Zanker. In this episode, Mark chats about his time flying with the Royal Air Force Aerobatic Display Team, the Red Arrows, and includes some great stories such as displaying in Australia and flying in formation with Concorde over Heathrow. He also chats about flying the Harrier GR7 and shares what it was like to fly in combat and also operating from HMS Invincible. If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like to support the channel, you can do this by helping us out monthly at patreon.com forward slash aircrewinterview, which allows us to continue to create new content every month and grow as a channel. Thank you and enjoy. So Mark, then you flew with the Red Arrows. Can you tell us how this even started and how you applied? Yeah, so I finished my time on three squadron and I was posted to back to the OCU at Wittering as an instructor. And uh, around about that time, I was, well, I must have been at an air show and I bumped into a friend of mine called Neil Rogers, who I was on the squadron with at Colter Short flying the Jaguar. And Neil was in the Red Arrows. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I said, well, how did that come about? And he said, well, I just applied. He said, why don't you apply? And I hadn't really thought about it, to be honest. Uh, obviously, it was something I'd, I would love, love to do, but I hadn't thought about it realistically. So I did. I, I applied. And at the same time, I also went up and spent a day with the team up at Scampton, which wasn't far from where I was at Wittering. And I uh, had a chat with the guys there. And I knew a couple of guys on the team. And, and um, I got to fly in the back seat on one of their display practices, which was you know, eye-opening to say the least, uh, completely different from anything I'd done before. And so, yeah, I put in an application. The problem was, though, because I was uh, an instructor on the OCU, I'd only just kind of got there, uh, the powers at B said, well, you know, you need to amortise your position here. We can't just let you go off to the Red Arrows. You're instructing, and we need need staff on the OCU. So I didn't didn't get shortlisted the first time I applied, so I applied the the following year. And the way they do the selection is they, at the time that we would get about, the team would get about 45 applications Mm -hmm. from fast jet pilots, and they would get that down to a short list of a maximum of nine, and then invite them to Scampton to spend the week with the team. Mm -hmm. So I I was picked for the short list, uh, went to Scampton, and I just thought, well, you know, uh, even if I don't get in the team, this is just an amazing uh, opportunity. Mm to fly in the back seat in all the positions in the team. You know, every, every one of the nine aircraft I could fly in the back seat, seat of, including the synchro pair. Uh, so that was just, just fantastic. I <laughs> just loved it. I can imagine. Um, and then, I just, then we went back at the end of the week and waited. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, yeah, I got selected. Yeah. So can you remember where you were when you got that call off? Um, it be oh, and I was at work. So I, so I was at Wittering on the staff. I think it was a Friday. If I, I know it was a Friday. Uh, there was a signal came to the squadron announcing that myself and my colleague as well that I worked with, uh, Spike Jepson, w- we were both selected. The boss announced it in the bar. And you can kind of know, you can imagine where it went from there. <laughs> <laughs> you saw heads in the morning. <laughs> Very sore head the next day. Uh, and, but I can remember thinking to myself, after the dust settled, oh my goodness, I've actually got to go and I've got to do the job do now. this now. <laughs> <laughs> it's one thing to get selected, it's quite another thing to actually be able to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I suddenly th- was quite daunting, you know, mm-hmm. quite a daunting task. So when did the training begin and was it quite difficult to get used to, you know, like aerobatic air formation flying? Um, so the, the season begins, the, the, the training begins at the end of the display season. The team finishes um, around September. They used to have a couple of weeks of, of leave and then they're straight into it. And uh, so I started in October of 1990, uh, 1993. And you start, you start small. You start off the, the leader and the, the three new pilots flying alongside him. And you just get, we get airborne and you just do looping and rolling for 25 minutes. And you do it three times a day. Oh, God. And it's not new because I'd done close formation before. You, do, you learn close formation when you're going through flying training. You know, you fly close formation, and I flew close formation in the Jaguar and in the, 
and in the Harrier. You have to because there are times when you have to penetrate bad weather. As a formation, you need to be in close formation. Mm -hmm. But it's one thing to sort of fly along in close formation and do a few gentle turns. It's quite another to do a loops and barrel rolls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine it. Uh, I, I couldn't do it anyway, let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what uh, position were you picked for in your first uh, season? So I, I was uh, number three. So uh, uh, that's the left-hand side, um, right next to the boss. Uh, for the first year. The second year I moved to five and the, my third year I was nine. Mm -hmm. So that's all on the left hand side of the, of the diamond. If, you, if you're looking down on top of the diamond, all on the left hand side. Right, yeah. And did you have a favourite manoeuvre over, over the three years? Was one that stuck out in your mind? Yeah, there's one, there's one manoeuvre that does stick out in my mind and it's not really a display manoeuvre. It came, came off, the, off of a manoeuvre. We used to do a thing called um, the vertical split kind of looks like a palm tree. You pull up, the front section pulls up, uh, as a, and, then, and then you split at the top, so you get this lovely kind of palm tree effect. But off of that manoeuvre, I had to rejoin with eight. I was, this was my third year. I had to rejoin with, with eight, and we had to get together so we could fly down the crowd and do an opposing cross with the main section. <laughs> and to do that, I would come off the top of this split basically pointing about 80 degrees nose down and I go full power I go as fast as I could and then I would roll in the vertical across the kind of to cross the circle and I would pull about 5g and I would just point at eight and I would so and I guess our closing speed uh, you know I have about 300 knots of closure closure on it and at some point when it looked about right I had to close the throttle put the speed brake out and then as I got a bit closer, I pulled, pulled G just to kill the energy. And if I got it right, I would just slide into position <laughs> just as we rolled out on the, on the runway center line. So that was my favorite. I absolutely loved it. It was a crazy yeah. maneuver. I can imagine, yeah. So did you enjoy interacting with the public at the air shows? It's what, it's what the team's all about. You know, it's very rewarding. I know you've interviewed Red Arrows pilots before, but it's one of the most rewarding parts of the job is, is actually getting to meet the public uh, and, and to entertain them, that's what, that's what you're there to do, and, and to represent the RAF and the country. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, incredibly enjoyable part of the job. You know, when, you, when you're a military fast jet pilot, you're, you're anonymous, no, no one hears about you. If there's a news story, you're never mentioned, obviously. You know, there, there's no interaction with the public. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, but for your three years in the team, yeah, yeah you, you, that, that's all part of the job. You couldn't do the job if you didn't enjoy that part of it, you know, it's very important. Absolutely, yeah. And you've had some memorable times on the team, uh, Sydney, obviously, and the Concord. Can you tell us about this? Because they're quite famous. I was really lucky. Uh, when, in 93, when I was selected for the team, they had just uh, done a tour of the US. And I was kind of like, oh, I can't believe I missed that. You know, that, that would have been fantastic. And, but what happened was in, in 1995, the... Uh, Industry wanted to promote the Hawk. They were trying to sell it, <clears throat> and so they arranged some overseas tours. They, they wanted the team to represent um, UK PLC and go overseas and, and, and promote the aeroplane, uh, as well as obviously representing the, the RAF uh, on a tour as, as we did. So the first one was South Africa, and the team had never been to South Africa before for political reasons. So that was fantastic. We, we did in October of ninety five. We went. We set off for. For South Africa, we spent 10 days there. And so we displayed at the uh, Waterkloof Air Show in Pretoria for four days. And then we went down to Cape Town. We displayed over the waterfront in Cape Town. Wow, that was amazing. We flew up the garden route to Durban. We displayed at Durban. So that was superb. And to, to get to fly in Africa was, was lovely. It was amazing, great experience. But we came back, we spent two weeks back in the, in at Scampton and then we left again and we went uh, east and we went through the Middle East uh, through Turkey and through Dubai and then we went through Pakistan and India and Thailand to Langkawi and we did the Langkawi air show for a week and then we the plan was then to go to Australia and again the team had never been to Australia before uh, and that was going to happen in January. So what we did, we left the aeroplanes in Butterworth in Malaysia. We flew home for Christmas and then we flew back out, got the aeroplanes, did some training. And then we went, we went down to, to Australia. We had a week in Australia. And of course we did the, we did the show over Sydney Harbour. 
which they say is the biggest crowd the team's ever d displayed in front of. The one million people plus? Yeah, then that's just a guess, isn't it? I mean, I, they, they don't know really, but uh, it, yeah, it was, it's Australia Day. It's, and of course, January, I think it was the 26th. Apologies if I got that wrong, but, uh, you know, it's their summer, beautiful weather. You know, I remember we got airborne and we were holding over Bondi Beach oh. <laughs> prior to running in for the, for the show, you know. Um, I do, I see what I do remember about that display was we came down the harbour over the bridge and then we did a big turn to come in over the Opera House to start the display. But as we came in over the Opera House, we actually went over the top of the, the downtown section of Sydney, which is all high rise buildings. And they've got these air conditioning units on the top, which are pumping air out. You know, um, there's, there's a lot of air coming out. I just remember hanging on for grim death it was so bumpy as we came in over the top of these buildings i'm thinking this is not a good start to, the, to this display but the rest of it went okay brilliant but there was also that famous picture of you in formation with concord over heathrow what was all that about so that was the 50th anniversary of heathrow and they uh, arranged this fly past uh closed obviously closed heathrow for half an hour and had this long fly past of aircraft from the earliest aircraft you know through to Concord, so, so we, we came through at the end. Uh, that, was, that was amazing. We, we flew from Stansted, so Concord was at Stansted and we were there, so we briefed with the pilots. And we had to, because if you know anything about the way the team flies their formation, but you, any, any formation that you fly, you, you use references on the aircraft that you're flying, so you line things up on their aircraft to, to make sure you stay in the same position. Well, with Concorde, we didn't really, there weren't really any references. We didn't know what they were. <laughs> so we sort of guess, guessed it. I think we got a cherry picker and we put somebody off the end of the wing of Concorde in approximately the place where we thought the pilot's head would be mm -hmm. on, on the wing. And then one of our pilots climbed out onto the wing of Concorde with a piece of Dayglo tape. And we, <laughs> we found a but we sort of stuck it on the side and we lined that up with a wingtip. We said, right, that's the, that's the reference. <laughs> <laughs> so we did, we had a couple of pieces of day glow tape, which you can't see in the photos, but they're there. <laughs> well, it's absolutely a stunning photo. Man. Yeah, we, um, so we took off from Stansted. We did, a, we flew over Duxford <clears throat> and then we came round uh, Essex and then down the Thames and mm -hmm. yeah, tremendous. Of course, you know, the team's flown with Concorde many times, but that was... Uh, Especially over Heathrow. That's yeah, that, that was a special one. Yeah. And a silly question, but you must enjoy your time on the Red Arrows. <laughs> Tremendous job, and it goes so quickly. Mm -hmm. It really goes quickly. Uh, I know Jace said the same thing in his interview that before you know it, the three years is up. Uh, the first year you are working so hard, you really are working hard, and you don't have the capacity to see what's going on, you know, outside of the, the show. You could be do doing a display at Farnborough or over the centre of London. You don't see it because all you're doing is looking at the leader. The second year you've got more capacity. By the third year, you're looking around, you can see everything. You're coming back from the display, saying, oh, do you see the traffic there? Do you see this, do you see that? The first years are going, what, I didn't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, it, but it goes quickly, really fast. So Mark, after your time on the Red Arrows, where did you go to? Uh, so I was, uh, I was kind of gonna go back to the Harrier Force and um, I was planning, my plan was to go back to the OCU uh, and be the instructor back at Wittering. But at the time, the Harrier Force was short of weapons instructors. And so they posted me to Four Squadron, which at that time was in uh, at Larbrook in Germany on the, on the Dutch border. Mm -hmm. And going back to the, uh, the, the Harrier, was there a lot more, uh, I guess, training to come into it because you've been off the, the tight for three years or was it just get back in? Uh, so I went back to Wittering to do the refresher course, just a short, uh, short course uh, to re-familiarise myself with the aeroplane. And by now, we, the squadrons had the GR7. So the cockpit was slightly different and you had uh, the bigger head-up display to accommodate the forward-looking infrared. And the, the lighting was uh, designed for use with night vision goggles. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, the aeroplane was the same. So. Uh, so yeah, I did that and then went, went back to the squadron and the, the actual night attack um, combat ready status was done on the squadrons, oh. not on the OCU. So the OCU didn't really do, do any of the night flying. Mm -hmm. It was all done by the squadrons. And you were also based on HMS Invincible. Can you talk us through this and how this happened? 
Yeah, you see, when I, when I joined the military, I, I, I went to the careers office in Bristol and there were two doors. There was one, oh, there, th there was three. There was one for the army, which obviously I wasn't interested in that. And there was the Navy and there was the Air Force. So I went in the Air Force door. Mm -hmm. I had no intention of <laughs> going on a ship. <laughs> I wouldn't either. But what happened, uh, um, the Harrier Force has always had um, a, a squadron that was capable of deploying uh, onto one of the, onto the Navy ship. Uh, and that uh, commitment was always done by one squadron. Mm -hmm. So whilst I was on, on four squadron, uh, one squadron were training on HMS Invincible, uh, specifically for the night flying role. Because they, they, they'd flown the airplane off there in daytime, but they now had to learn to, to do night ops. Mm -hmm. And they were in the Mediterranean, and whilst they were doing a night sortie one night, the boss of one squadron, uh, he crashed alongside the, the ship. Luckily, he survived. But they, um, you know, they, they had to do a bit of rethinking about how they were going to do things. Uh, there was a shut that pe people were shuffled around. And then it, this was between the two between the two Gulf Wars, and there was some uh, problems in in Iraq. Uh, with weapons inspectors and UN inspections and things started to get a little bit tense and the, the government sent Invincible from the Mediterranean towards the Gulf and it was just before Christmas in, in 1997 and I get, I get this call from my boss, can you come and see me? And he said, uh, one squadron, uh, they're embarked. I said, yeah, he said, they, they need a QI. I said, all right, <laughs> he said, and it's you. <laughs> so, um, I had to go, I flew down to Yeovilton and they have a thing there called the Dunker. It's a big swimming pool yeah. with a big helicopter rig and they basically strap you in a helicopter and, and plunge you upside down into the swimming pool. It's really unpleasant <laughs> and you have to escape. It's horrible, absolutely horrible. I had to do that and then I also had to fly off the ski, ski ramp there and they have a, like a dummy deck marked out on the ground. I did some vertical landings onto there. And then just after Christmas I flew down to Bari and I embarked on, on the ship and uh, went from there through the Suez Canal um, down around into the Gulf. And so I spent, I think it was about four months on Invincible and we were doing uh, sorties over Southern Iraq, uh, policing the no-fly zone. Mm -hmm. And how did you feel about that mission? Uh, it was a mission like any other, I was fine about it. Um, right. It was another interesting entry in my logbook to fly off an aircraft carrier. That, that was quite an experience. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, one so that can I, you talk us through that? What was it like landing and taking off? I mean, it must have been quite terrifying the first few times. Uh, yeah, terrifying. Yeah, it was terrifying. And, you know, they, you see those ships in, in port and you think, oh, that, that's, that's big, but it's not very big when you're trying to land on it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite small. And, and if you compare it in size to one of the American carriers or the new Queen Elizabeth yeah. class that we've got, you know, tiny. Mm -hmm. And at one point, we had the most Harriers that had ever been on Invincible, I think, because we had, they, they put all of the helicopters went ashore, bar one, I think. And we had Sea Harriers and GR7s on, on board, and there were just Harriers everywhere. So, you know, you start, when you get in the airplane, the tail of the aircraft off the back of the ship, so you can't walk all the way around it. Uh, you know, it's that tight, and you literally just, pull forward onto on, and line up on the on the deck and you've got aircraft all around you. Often there's an airplane in front, only a few meters in front, slamming to full power. Uh, and the, the ski jump doesn't look like a gentle slope, it kind of looks like a brick wall. <laughs> so it's terrifying the first time you, you do it. And then probably more terrifying is, is landing because you, there is no other option to go anywhere else. You don't have the fuel to go anywhere else. You have to land on the on the ship, so and you only really have enough for a couple of circuits. Mm -hmm. So, it, uh, you know, and if you're number two, you're coming in alongside or behind the, the leader, and if he takes a bit longer than usual, then you know you're burning more fuel, and it all gets a bit tense. Imagine. Yeah. But uh, what was it like working with their uh, navy crews? Was there any banter there? A huge amount of banter. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we quickly cottoned onto the idea that they don't like the portholes co being called windows <laughs> or hatches. They don't like, they're not doors. And it's a ship, it's not a boat. Boats are submarines. So, of course, we called it a boat. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> so, there was a huge amount of banter. Yeah. 
healthy banter. Uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> we, we got as good as, as we gave as well, I think. <laughs> so what were the living conditions like on board? Obviously, very cramped, I can imagine. Yeah, so, so I'd never been on a, on a boat like that before. And I was, I was shown to my cabin while I was sharing, sharing it with three other pilots. And of course, being a, an RAF pilot, we're not used to slumming it. And uh, I, I said, I didn't really like this. Is there, is there any other options? So I said, well, you can, you can apply for your own cabin. But it'll take months. Really? It'll take months to get one because they're, they're in short supply and there's a long waiting list. So the next day I went and saw the, uh, the sort of mess manager and I put my name down for a cabin. And the very next day he said, yeah, there's, a, there's one that's available. <laughs> so I went straight into my own, my own cabin. But the, the interesting thing is the cabins, the officers' cabins are right underneath the back of the uh, deck. So you're literally a few feet below the flight deck. And that's fine because at night there's no flying, usually, or if there is, it's only for a short period of time. But what they do do is the engineers do all of their uh, engineering and rectification work, and often that involves doing engine runs. And on the Harrier, they need to run the engine at full power. And to do that, what they would do, uh, and not just on the ships, but they do this in the Harrier force, they bolt the air, they, they chain the aircraft to the, to the ground so they can literally run it at full power. And they'll, they'll point the nozzles vertically down and, and select full power. So a few feet above me, I have Pegasus engine pretty much every night at full, at full power. And the other thing is, of course, the, the Navy know that, that the officers are sleeping below. So every time they have to chain the airplanes or unchain them, they, they deliberately drop the chains onto the deck <laughs> and make as much noise as possible. <laughs> Brilliant. But having said that, for a ship the size of Invincible, it had an awfully big... Uh, wardroom. I mean, the bar was, was huge. <laughs> I bet that was, yeah, so, nice you know, time. we spent quite a bit of time in there. <laughs> but uh, you also flew the GR7 over Kosovo. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, so I was coming to the end of my, what, what they call the 38 point. So that was the decision point for either staying in the Air Force or, or leaving. This is the end of my, my contracted time. And I was, I'd now, uh, I'd, now transferred over to one squadron with that move to Invincible and, and I'd followed them back to Wittering. So we were now based at Wittering and we went off and we did a red flag exercise. And whilst we were out there, the ten tensions were starting to build up in, in Kosovo between Serbia and Kosovo. And um, I think three squadron were down in deployed in Joy del Col uh, as part of the peacekeeping uh, commitment when they were doing flying over for what was formerly Bosnia and but it was coming to the end of their time and there was a rotation coming up and we were next so we suddenly found ourselves within a few weeks going down to to Joya with the prospect of of operations mm -hmm. so it was quite a quick um, sort of ramp up uh, we started doing quite a lot of training with um, uh, precision guided munitions and the tile targeting pod which we hadn't done much work with. The airplane was fully wired up for it, but we didn't, hadn't had uh, much training with that. Uh, that pod has got a TV camera, uh, it's got a, an infrared camera, and it's got a laser. Um, so you can you use it for, for marking the target for laser-guided weapons. So we did a lot of training with that, and then before we knew it, we were out in Joya, and we weren't there very long before uh, the, the conflict started. So I was involved from the first night operation right to the end. I think it's four, four to five months. Mm -hmm. Quite intensive, working every day and every night. Um, so quite, you know, quite tiring, but uh, interesting stuff, you know, and it was the end of my, the end of my Air Force career to suddenly find myself on, on operations, mm -hmm. having spent all of it training. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly one for the longboat, that's for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, overall, did you enjoy your time on the Harrier GR7 and on the Harrier Force as a whole? Yeah, I feel tremendously privileged to have been able to fly this aeroplane and to fly this, the GR3, right through to the GR7. And it was such a capable aeroplane and it was so sad when it was uh, retired from service so suddenly. It was such a capable aeroplane. It was doing such a great job in, in theatre. Uh, just. It, it evolved into such an efficient and capable machine, mm -hmm. and I loved every minute of it. Absolutely did. Oh, yeah. Jealous, awesome. 
I, the only thing is, I, I, I was talking to someone the, the other day who flies the F-35, and I said I'd quite like to have a go in that. <laughs>